We're going to continue with Hello Universe. This is chapter 17. When we last we left off, Virgil is walking through the woods. And who does he meet? He meets Chet. And uh, Chet takes Virgil's backpack and runs away with it. And Virgil chases him. Chet takes it to an old abandoned uh, well and drops it into the well. And of course, Gulliver is in the backpack. Chapter 17, Going Underground. There are more than 7,000 islands in the Philippines. Some don't even have people living on them. And then there are some that once had people but don't anymore, like the lowland island of Balatama. Lola had told Virgil all about it. According to Lola, Balatama was once a thriving island in the south. It thrived so much that the people kept taking, taking, taking land that belonged to the mountain creatures. One day, the people cut down a gathering of trees that belonged to a majestic bird named Pa. Pa had the wingspan of an elephant and talons as sharp as knives. When the trees were cut down, he was so angry that he grew bigger and bigger. When he spread his wings, they were so large and dark that they blotted out the sunlight. This made Pa happy because the darkness blinded the villagers. They would get lost and wander in circles, and then Pa would swoop down, pluck them up, and eat them. Pa controlled the darkness and used it as a weapon. He knew that darkness turned people weak because it confused them and made them wander. The, wander. the darkness created easy victims because no one could fight an enemy they could not see. Pa's talons would sever the villagers in half before they even realized they were in trouble. Virgil was eight years old the first time he heard the story of Pa. Now, as he leaned over the side of the well, he half expected Pa's talons to come shooting out of it, even though it was a bright, sunny afternoon above ground. The deep well that now created Gulliver was a dark, dark place, and darkness was darkness, whether it was in the sky or not. Virgil's heart thundered in his ears. A tight knot collected in his chest and rose, rose, rose until it pushed its way to his eyes, which pooled with tears. Gulliver, he said. The inky blackness gaped up at him like the throat of a hungry beast. It smelled musty and dank and deathly. But Gulliver was down there. He couldn't leave Gulliver, not for a second. There was hope, though. A ladder. He had no choice. He emptied his pockets of the stones and set them carefully on the rim of the well. Then he started his journey down. The descent was unsteady. Virgil's foot hesitated before every rung, but ultimately landed, quivering where it belonged. With each step, he gripped the ladder tighter and tighter until his knuckles ached. Down, down, down. Was the bottom of the well full of water? Was Gulliver drowning, struggling to breathe? So deep and black was that well that Virgil couldn't see anything, not even when he was six rungs down. And for a moment, he thought that maybe he descended for nothing. Maybe the bull hadn't thrown Gulliver inside after all, and he just imagined the whole thing. But then, after what seemed like forever, there it was, not floating in water, but slouched on its side at the bottom of the well. Zipper still open just an inch, just enough for Gulliver to breathe. The darkness had invaded Virgil's lungs and choked him, and he couldn't breathe until he knew Gulliver was breathing too. He listened for him, chuttering, chirping, anything, but all he heard was the drumming of his own heart. Virgil was still a fair, fair distance from the bottom when he lowered his foot and discovered there was no longer a rung for him to step onto. He clutched the rusty bars and cranked his neck to look down, slowly, slowly, so as not to lose his balance, and realized he'd reached the end of the ladder. But he needed two more rungs at least. The backpack wasn't within reach, not even close, and his legs weren't long enough to touch the ground. Virgil could see the backpack. He couldn't tell if there was any movement inside, but he certainly couldn't just climb back out and give up without, not without Gulliver. The thought of abandoning Gulliver was far worse than the realization that he'd have to jump. He pulled himself closer to the ladder, hugging it almost, chest to iron, 
as if the mere thought of jumping would send him falling to his death. And now he heard his own breathing. It broke through the silence in quick, rapid spurts, like the hiccups. All at once he began to sweat. A faucet inside him turned on and everything dampened. The inside of his elbows, the palms of his hands, the space between each of his perfectly shaped fingers, the back of his neck, each hair-lined follicle of his forehead, his size five feet, the space between his shoulder blades, everything. If this was how the body prepared to jump, he thought it wasn't very useful. He lowered his right foot and pressed the toe of the, his sneaker against the well, then brought his right hand down to the next iron bar. He stayed like that for several moments, unsure what to do, looking like two halves of one boy, one climbing down, the other going up. He didn't lower his left hand until his legs started to ache, and he didn't move his other foot until he absolutely had to. When he did, he was hanging from the third to last rung like there were monkey bars, which he'd never been able to cross in his entire life. He went down to the next bar and pointed his toe to see if he felt the ground yet. Nothing. He lowered himself again and again. Now he dangled from the ladder with nowhere else to go but down. He had to let go, but he couldn't. A dozen images fired through his brain. He saw himself clutching a broken arm and wailing in pain. He saw twisted ankles with the bones sticking out, a head injury that left him motionless until he finally evaporated into a skeleton, a bloody gash above his eyebrow as he slammed against the well's rugged walls. These all seemed like likely scenarios, that with the distance to the bottom. But there was Gulliver. Gulliver, said Virgil. He expected his voice to echo, but it didn't. He looked up. The mouth of the well was a perfect circle above him. There was daylight there and air. There were trees and birds and Lola. The well smelled like an old sock. The world smelled like trees and grass. He looked up at the light. He looked down at Gulliver. He let go. There are many terrible things that can happen to a boy who jumps into a well. He could break his head open, suffer a broken arm, twist his ankle, bones sticking out, all that, or his cell phone could fall out of his pocket and shatter into a million pieces. Virgil's phone and his feet hit about half a second apart. As soon as he felt the ground under his sneakers and the numb tingling of pain from impact, he realized two things. He had landed safely he, and his phone had not. But the first thing he did was grab his backpack and zip it open. He reached in to feel Gulliver and heard a single healthy chirp. Gulliver was none the wiser. He just wanted a dandelion, so Virgil gave him one. You're okay, Virgil said, even though Gulliver already knew this. Virgil's heart had been a steady drumbeat in his ears, but it, but it quelled now. He rested the backpack against the wall and reached for his phone. It had broken into three pieces, screen, battery, and everything else. Virgil put the pieces back together because you don't give up without trying, Lola always said. All the king's horses and all the king's men, said Virgil, snapping the battery in place. It fit fine, but he could see already that there was no hope for the screen. There was a crack in the corner that branched out like a spider web. Couldn't put Humpty together again. He tried to turn it on, but nothing happened. He tried again. He shook it. He took it apart again and put it back back together. He kept his thumb on the power button until it hurt. Nothing. He put the phone in his pocket anyway. Then he tipped his head back and looked up, up, up. The light was there, but it was far away like a cloud he couldn't touch. He stood under the ladder. He reached towards the bottom rung, but his fingers were nowhere near it. He got on his tiptoe so high that it hurt but he still couldn't reach. He bent his knees and jumped with all his might, arms outstretched, and, and that didn't do any good either. If I were Joselito or Julius, I wouldn't have, I would have no trouble reaching the ladder, he thought. But then again, if I were Joselito or Julius, I wouldn't be down here in the first place. He jumped again. He looked towards the light. 
Hello, he said, hesitant at first. Hello, then louder. Hello, hello, hello. He knew it wouldn't do any good. No one was even out in the woods, even though if they were, they probably couldn't hear him. And that was chapter 17.